So welcome everyone to whoops, the second to last emergency response program webinar that we're holding here. I'm getting kind of sad that we're almost done. Um, just so everyone knows, if you ever want to go back and watch any of these webinars, or if you'd like to um, view any of the webinars that we held in other markets, you can go to our Vimeo page, vimeo.com slash generator, and you can go ahead and take a peek at any of those. So again, today we are talking about mental health and wellness for business owners and their employees. And to lead that discussion, we have Andy Maurer with us, who is a licensed therapist based in Phoenix. So um, joining us all the way from the other side of the country, that's the, the beauty of everything being virtual now. We're really excited to have him here. Again, quick reminder, uh, there is a Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. So there's just a little blurb with Q&A. Feel free to hit that and uh, let us know if you have any questions for Andy throughout today's discussion. Um, we are hoping that this will be more of a fireside chat style. So feel free to ask questions throughout and ask questions often. Again, unfortunately, if you have technical issues, we cannot help with those during today's webinar, and we do encourage you to reach out to Zoom directly if you need any help. Okay, so with that, I am going to hand it over to Andy, and we will get started today. All right. Andy, hopefully you can see your face big I in the middle of the I screen. <laughs> I can't see your face. That's okay. You don't want to see my face right now. <laughs> okay. All right, um, I'm going to close out the second video then because I don't want to see myself twice. <laughs> um, okay, so I know that it would be really great for everyone on the call today to get a chance to hear a little bit more about you and your background, um, just as you know, a high-level preface for this. And then as soon as you're done with that, maybe rolling straight into... Um, you know, what are, what are some of the things that you're seeing right now specifically for business owners and um, business leaders? What are they struggling with at this time and, and what's the current landscape? Yeah, well, let me give you a little bit of background on who I am since a lot of people don't know where I'm coming from or why I'm doing this work. So I am a licensed therapist. I'm also an emotional wellness coach for high level leaders. So I specifically work with CEOs and founders, entrepreneurs and influencers. And I started getting into this work a couple of years ago. Before I was a therapist, I was actually a personal trainer. I was in the health and wellness space. And as I was in that space working on physical health, I started to realize that people weren't doing so well on the inside emotionally. Um, they were actually doing really well on the outside physically, but the things that you can't typically see, the things that are happening inside their mind and inside their heart, they were really struggling. And it didn't matter how physically fit I would make them, emotionally they would still um, struggle in a lot of different ways. So I wanted to pivot and transition into therapy. So I went back to school, got my master's degree, and I decided to do therapy. And what I realized was I actually had a lot of leaders come into my office, which was a surprise to me because I thought that maybe I wanted to work with couples and families and individuals. But what I found was I had a lot of high level leaders, CEOs and founders, and entrepreneurs, and um, ministry leaders and leaders from all different kinds of platforms and spaces coming in and processing what's actually going on beneath that kind of polished exterior beneath the surface. And I started asking them questions like, do you have anyone else that you process these things with? And they said, no, that's why I'm here meeting with you because I can't share this with my team. I can't share this with my employees. Um, maybe I can share this with my spouse, but I don't really have a lot of connections that I go deep with. Um, so that really inspired me to shift gears and say, okay, how do I solely focus on leaders and entrepreneurs around issues of what it means to be emotionally whole? And one of the things that I realized is that we treat our leaders as assets. We treat them as assets to be leveraged, but we don't really treat them as people to be loved or cared for. And what I mean by that is, um, 
being really involved in the startup community here in Phoenix and in the startup community in different um, cities around uh, the US, I realized um, these founders in these companies, they're squeezed so tightly to get everything out of them in a short period of time. And then most of them are discarded on the side when they don't produce or when they don't perform. And in that process of building and running a company, they lose what's most important to them. They lose their family, they lose their friends, they lose their sense of well-being, their health, sleep. They lose all the most important things in their life. And then they're typically discarded. And I realize that it shouldn't be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. What does it look like to care for leaders, not only as assets that we can get something from, but as people that we can care about, that we can support and get to know. Well, that's a little bit of my background and where I come from. As far as what I'm seeing with leaders right now during COVID-19, it is a mixture. So even the poll that everyone took, there are a lot of leaders who are very optimistic, very hopeful about where things will go. They're very innovative in their ability to pivot and to move and transition. But then there's a category of leaders who are really suffering and struggling. So it is a mixture. Um, the two things that I see happening the most, and we can talk about this more, Abby, but uh, two areas that I see happening the most are around grief and ironically around uh, trauma. And those are the last things that leaders want to talk about. Specifically, when a leader comes into my room and they sit down, they typically say, hey, Andy, I want tools and tactics and techniques to know how to get from point A to point B. So give them to me. That's what they're used to. And when I say, well, hold on a second, why don't we just pause and we slow down and we notice kind of what's happening in your body right now. Um, notice your breath, notice your posture, notice the thoughts that are rolling through your mind. What, what are the emotions? They, they really struggle with that. They don't typically have the toolbox around how to make sense of what's going on in the inside. Um, so around grief, um, I see that as a major issue kind of coming up in uh, our society right now, and really globally, we have this collective global grief that is happening. And grief is simply a process of having something die. It doesn't have to be a person. It could be a hope and a dream. It could be a business. It could be letting go employees and really struggling with the death or the loss of letting people go and knowing that that's impacting them emotionally, relationally, economically. And I think the way that we're responding to that in the business community um, is we're using language like uh, pivot. This is an opportunity to pivot. Or we are using language like, look at all of these companies that came out of the 2008 recession. Um, this is a great, fantastic opportunity for us to find our spot and to grow our business, which are all very true but they are in that kind of vein of grief, which is a lot about denial, which is uh, our inability to wanna to believe that we've lost something. And the reality is I myself have lost a lot. I've lost the ability to connect with people face to face. I've lost the ability to, um, some of my hopes and dreams have been lost. I feel a sense of frustration and anger every time I have to get on another Zoom meeting because what I really wanna do is connect with people face to face. Um, so that's, that's one area that I think is coming up and we can talk about the process of grief and how I see that playing out in leaders' lives as, as time goes on today, Abby. But the other issue that I think is coming up a lot too is the issue of trauma. And um, most leaders will tell me, uh, I don't have trauma. Well, it's kind of unavoidable right now in this season. Uh, the largest study that was ever done a couple of years ago found that 70% of people have experienced trauma. And in the US, US was ranked third highest country with traumatic exposure. 82% of us have experienced trauma and about 30% of us have experienced four or more. And trauma isn't just uh, domestic violence, it's just not abuse. Trauma happens when we go through life and we experience an event, a uh, set of circumstances or multiple events that cause us to feel overwhelmed emotionally or physically. And they impact us functionally. Yeah, relationally, occupationally, spiritually, emotionally.
So it's an event that happens that kind of jars our stress response system and it impacts our ability to function well. Um, so those would be two big things that I see coming up that are not really being talked about with leaders. But if we fail to talk about those two things, what we're going to do is we're going to have leaders stuffing a lot of what's going on inside. And eventually when we stuff so much of our emotion, it blows out and it explodes in different areas. Um, so yeah. that's where I would kind of start with two big things that I'm seeing in leadership um, and a little bit of my background and why I got into this and what I, what I specifically do. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. So for people who, uh, who might be experiencing grief and trauma, um, what are some of the tools that you are giving your own patients and clients and saying, you know, here are some, you know, quick and easy silver bullet type tools that you can yeah. use immediately to maybe shift your mindset, but then what are some more, you know, long-term um, tools and resources to be aware of as well? Yeah, exactly. This is a question I get a lot. Um, and let me preface this real quickly because I actually want to provide resources and tools for all of you, but I think something needs to happen first. The thing that needs to happen first is we have to pause and we have to slow down and we have to ask ourselves what's happening inside of my body right now, inside of my heart, and inside of my mind. And if we can't slow down and we can't begin to feel what's happening in our body and in our mind and in our heart, then the tools that we're going to get and the strategies that we're going to get are really a stay in avoidance and cause us to neglect actually what's going on side. So like I said, the first time that leaders come in, the first thing that they want is they want those tools and those strategies because uh, I, th I think it's multiple reasons, but one of the reasons that I see is that they, um, they struggle with ambiguity, ambiguity. They struggle with not knowing what to do, um, losing their sense of identity and their performance. That's who they know themselves to be. So when they can't perform or figure something out, they feel lost and confused. And I want to give everybody here permission that you're not going to be able to figure this one out so, so quickly and easily. Um, so I think the first thing to do is to pause in this moment, take a deep breath, a couple deep breaths, and ask ourselves, where am I at right now? What's going on inside of my body? Is my energy level high? Is it, is it low? Do I feel a sense of pleasantness in my body or unpleasantness? When you can answer that question, then you can start to implement the tools. But if you're implementing tools before you slow down, then you're doing it much more as a form of denial. And what gets stored in our body doesn't go away. It just explodes later into depression or anxiety or burnout or suicidal thoughts or conflict with our spouse or kids. So with that said, some helpful tools. Uh, one of my favorite tools is to change my body, to change my mood. So we know that the longest nerve in the human body is called the vagus nerve. And that runs from the base of my brain all the way down through every vital organ in my body, my heart, my digestive tract, um, and it ends in our, in our uh, kind of our hip. And 90% of that nerve, the vagus nerve, is actually sending signals from our body up to our brain. Now, most nerves in our brain are sending signals from our brain down to our body to have our body respond. So this is, this is unique. This is the longest nerve in our body. It goes through every vital organ, and it's sending a lot of signals up to our brain. So when we uh, put our feet flat on the ground, so most, most of us are sitting like this in meetings or hunched over, legs crossed. When we place feet flat on the ground and we can feel our feet flat on the ground, do that with me right now. We take a deep breath and we don't try to puff our chest out, but we try to strengthen our spine and straighten it kind of like feeling like it's steel, a steel bar is in our spine. And then we feel our chest kind of open up and we feel it warm and soft. When we can do that, we can take a couple deep breaths. We are activating the vagus nerve and that's actually gonna send signals up to our brain to cause our brain to calm or to relax or to um, 
decreased levels of anxiety or stress. So when you're in difficult meetings with employees, when you're, when you're trying to do a video, when you're during conflict, when you're feeling jarred inside, the best thing to do is place your feet flat on the ground, notice your feet on the ground, straighten your spine, take a deep breath, and that's actually gonna look, that's actually gonna calm your body. Now, if you are tight and you're like this, which is often a very stressful position when we feel stressed and we feel anxious, our body collapses. Because notice, um, so let me stand up here. Notice that when I collapse like this, I'm protecting the most vital parts of my body, so my chest and my digestive tract. It's a self protective mechanism for our shoulders to come forward. And what that does is it decreases our ability to breathe deeply and take oxygen throughout our body. So strengthening our spine, opening up our hands and our body is going to allow blood flow to increase. It's going to allow oxygen to increase in our body. So that's one really, really practical, helpful technique that I have a lot of people do to ground it and stay uh, centered. I love that. And I love that that's something that you can do immediately, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So hopefully many of you followed along with that and you're, you're already feeling better. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so let's say, um, you know, during these one-on-one -on -one meetings, there are a lot of people who are experiencing a lot of stress right now and a lot of um, just, sadness and sorrow and that, that grief that you talked about um, as it relates to having to make tough decisions about their employees. And I think, you know, um, Generator has done a lot of these emergency response programs across the country. And when we got our first, I don't know, thousand or so applications in, uh, signups rather than applications, we did a word cloud of the, the things that people said they were struggling with the most. And the number one um, word on that word cloud was employees. And so I know that people are feeling a lot of grief around, you know, not being able to provide for their employees right now. Yes. Is that something that you ha have seen and experienced and what kind of, um, I guess, just what do you have to, to say to speak to that? And then also, how, how should business owners be thinking about, you know, protecting their own mental health and wellness while also trying to um, take care of their employees? Yeah, this is a tough and really complex question because all leaders are going to be different and everybody's going to go through grief in a different way. But when you have to lay off employees or when you can't provide resources for employees that you were or even a game plan for where you were going, grief is involved. And there is a process of grief. It, think of it more like a scaffolding. It's not really a linear process, but it is um, some things that you'll notice come up. The first thing is that you'll move into a state of denial. You don't really want to believe that you have to make these decisions with your team. You don't want to have to believe that it's come down to this. You're going to do everything that you can to make it not happen, which is good. But then we typically move to a sense of bargaining, which is working very hard to make sure that we don't have to let employees go, that we don't have to experience this grief and the sadness. So we'll want to stay up in the more positive emotions and avoid the more difficult emotions such as sadness or loss. And, you know, one of the things that I see that's really interesting in the business community, especially with leaders, is this this mindset of pivot, like I said, although very helpful, is a form of bargaining <laughs> because we are basically saying, okay, we can't have it this way. We're going to pivot and make sure that we can get it a different way. And that's, uh, that's going to lead to a lot of difficulty with grief because if you think about grief, if you try to wrestle grief and make it be your master and you try to make it work for you, you'll lose 100% of the time. So you actually have to open up your hands and you have to start asking questions such as, okay, what does this grief want to produce in me as a leader? And most leaders can think of themselves, uh, can think more in optimistic and kind of uh, self-development kind of ways. So you have to ask questions such as, okay, what kind of leader is this going to produce inside of me? That can be a sense of hopefulness. So you have denial, you have bargaining, then you move into a sense of anger 
a sense of injustice of it shouldn't be this way. Then you move into a sense of depression, which is kind of a trigger word for a lot of leaders because they have a lot of things that they have to do. So the idea of feeling numb or flat or discouraged is highly um, difficult for them to embrace because they have to get a lot done. So they typically jump over that stage. And then we move into acceptance. And then we move into a sense of creating a sense of, of meaning and hope. And what's been interesting with a lot of these loans, the PPP and the SBA disaster relief loan and some of these other ones is, I think a lot of organizations have received funding, but all of this hope around being able to get income, to take care of my employees, to maintain my business, has kind of fallen to despair in some ways. You know, I just got an email this morning from the SBA saying that disaster relief loan, that $10,000 grant, that's gonna be based on how many employees you have, um, and you're gonna get $1,000 for every employee you have. Well, that really impacts small businesses or sole, sole proprietors um, or small companies. And it, it, these hopes of what could be are getting deflated by the reality of what is. And that's just discouraging all around. And especially companies who feel like they have a strong culture where employees are a family, to let someone go is devastating. Um, and it can cause leaders to ask questions such as, um, how did we get here? Um, what kind of person or leader does this make me? And in order to survive that, leaders honestly, they have to kind of shut down all emotions to get through. Um, the times that I've been the most stressed, I find myself wanting to shut down all my emotions just to make it through all those hard conversations. But you got to have a window and you got to have a time in your day. Maybe it's 10 minutes at night by yourself in a room that feels safe. Maybe it's on a walk at night where you don't have to hold it together, where you don't have to show up for people and you simply start asking questions like, okay, how was today? How am I doing? Um, what's going on beneath uh, the performance-based leader that I have to be. Um, it's really creating little windows and times when you slow down and you start asking those good questions. Because if you don't do that, you're just going to be on the treadmill running, trying to survive, and uh, you will burn out and you'll move to depression. And, and then uh, you won't be able to produce. And the way that I think about why it's so important for leaders to grieve now is because if we fail to grieve now, there will be an opportunity to grow and develop in the future. Right now is kind of not that time in a lot of ways. We're just ugh, frozen. There will be a season for that. And if we fail to grieve now, we're going to be burned out when we get to the season where we need our best energy to move forward. So give yourself permission that all of us are going through grief. It's not uncommon for you to feel depressed or angry or anxious or fearful or um, sad. Those are really normal emotions and you're actually more of a psychopath if you're not feeling a lot of emotions. It just means that you're shut down, you're flat, you're numb. Yeah. And how do you balance um, wanting to put on a strong front for your employees, but then also, you know, is it important to show your employees the sides of you that are struggling with this or is it more important to be that kind of strong front leader yeah one of the things that i hear a lot is um, i have to keep the energy positive because people need a leader who has belief and hope right now especially when they're feeling discouraged and i think some of that's true but you know what i i, I believe that we put more on our shoulders and more in our backpack than we actually need to so we have ideas around what our employees are expecting from us right now around optimism and hopefulness and resiliency. And I bet, um, honestly, if we asked our employees, if we asked our key people in our business, hey, what's your expectation of me right now with everything going on? Uh, what do you most need from me? If we ask those questions or questions like, what's your expectation of me as a leader right now? And we hear feedback from our team on what they're needing from us. That can really help um, clarify for us to take things out of our backpack messages about who we need to be or about what it means to be a good leader. 
um, that we can let go of and we can say, okay, who do I need to be for my team and what do they expect me to be? And let go of all of those other messages of what it means to be a good leader. And most times um, research has shown that when we can have a psychologically safe workplace, when we can let it be okay for people to express failures, difficult emotions, discouragements, when we can allow that to happen, we actually are allowing creativity and innovation and motivation. Because without failure, you can't have creativity. Creativity is a very intense, vulnerable process because it means that we're, we're tweaking things, we're adjusting, we're saying that didn't work, this did work, and we're adjusting and we're shifting. If you are not allowing failure to be a reality or even pain to be a reality, then your organization and your company won't pivot, it won't shift, it won't be creative, it will be stuck in a performance-based anxiety that I have to get it a certain way. And guess what? That comes from the leader. It doesn't matter how strong you've communicated to your team. They will look at you and they will see how you are responding as a leader. And if you're stuffing your emotion, you will be telling them subconsciously, it is not okay for you to express your emotion. Doesn't mean you have to come into the office and express all the grief and sadness that you feel. You feel like the business is not going to survive and all of that. But it can start by, by doing a simple check-in during the day or multiple times during the day um, and just saying, hey, there's, uh, there's a part of me today that's really hopeful. I think we're going to be able to make it through. But then there's, just to be honest, there's another part of me that's really tired and exhausted and I'm just worn out. And I just want to give the rest of the team the opportunity, the freedom to just say we're just worn out and brainstorm around what we need as a team around that. I really like when leaders are able to acknowledge both parts. So typically we say things like I'm happy or I'm good or I'm depressed or I'm sad. And I'll have people come into my office and they'll say, hi, Andy, I'm, I'm depressed. And I'm like, really? I thought your name was John. <laughs> and they're like, no, well, my name is John, but I'm depressed. And I'm like, I know, but you're describing yourself as this one feeling or this one emotion when really you're much more complex than that. I think there's a part of you that's depressed, but because you're sitting here on the couch, I also think there's a part of you that's hopeful. Otherwise you would have stayed in your bed all morning long. Mm -hmm. The fact that you got here and you sat down tells me that there's a part of you that believes that it will get better. And there's a part of you that believes that it's really difficult right now. And if we can go in with our leadership team or with our employees and use parts language, say, Hey, as your leader, I want to let you know there's a part of me that is driven and hopeful and I'm going to keep committing to you. And at the same time, there's a part of me that is really struggling to sleep right now. I don't know how to slow down. Um, I'm really struggling with some fear around these three categories. Mm -hmm. And I just want to lay that out there. It gives people the freedom to recognize, oh, Andy's not just depressed. Oh, he's not just an optimist. He's balanced. He can be food and a couple different emotions at the same time. And that's actually, research shows us that we, uh, we have multiple parts happening and multiple emotions happening at the same time, not just one emotion. Yeah. But um, one of the kickers is that if we try to selectively numb one emotion, so let's say we really don't like depression or we really don't like anger. So we try to tone down that one emotion. Well, research shows that when we tone down that one emotion, it's like an equalizer. Every emotion gets toned down. So then we have to ask leaders these questions of, man, why can't I feel a sense of purpose and meaning? Why can't I feel joy in the work that I'm doing? Why can't I feel happiness and excitement and pleasure? Well, because you're really not allowing yourself to feel sadness and fear and loneliness. If you want to feel the positive emotions, you got to feel the uncomfortable emotions because otherwise you're going to land right here in numb. And when we look at a heart rate monitor in the hospital, we know that a, a heart rate monitor that's flatlined means someone's not living. And for leaders, I don't want you to just be going through life not living. I want you to be experiencing high levels of growth and success and delight and enjoyment and purpose and meaning, but I'm sorry. Because if you want to feel those things, you got to feel the sadness and the fear and the depression and the anxiety. You don't have to live there. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to build a home there, but you got to like, you got to camp out there for a night or two, like take a tent, camp out, get to know that place. 
and then get back to work. You don't have to build a home there, but you do have to camp there for a little bit. I love that analogy. Um, I want to invite everyone, just as a reminder, we're about halfway through with our webinar. I know we usually get a ton of questions all piled on at the end, and then we typically don't have time to get through all of them. So if you do have a question that's been sitting in the back of your mind, please make use of that Q&A chat bot so that we can, uh, chat box rather, so that we can um, get your questions answered. Um, shifting gears a little bit, and I I know that this might not be something that is typically part of your day-to-day -day discussions, but given the situation that we're all in, I think a lot of people are um, dealing with a new challenge and that is working from home while um, you know, having children at home and having other responsibilities and having other activities flying around while they're trying to focus and get work done. And I know for a lot of people that has created a very stressful environment for them that many people are struggling with. So I, I just wanted to open up the discussion and see if you have any thoughts or tips or experiences uh, to speak into, into that situation. Yeah, well, let me validate the reality that unless you have a very large home, where you can basically go to a guest house and not be interrupted at all for long periods of time, which is probably not all of us, it's some of us. Um, I have to come to this office. Um, there's no one here today, but this is my office and there's maybe one or two or three people here all day long. So it's very, very slow and I, it allows me to focus. The times that I have had to work from home are extremely difficult to stay focused because I have a five-year-old and I have a three-year-old and they'll scream, they'll knock on the door, they'll have fits and I can't do calls because you know my house is tile and sound goes everywhere. So it can be very, very difficult and challenging. And I think when I have worked from home, um, the things that have been helpful was just to give myself permission to not be as productive. <laughs> And when we expect ourselves to be as productive at home as we are in a uh, work environment, it's just not realistic in some ways. Now, what I would encourage you to do is try to do deep work. Um, if you've ever read the book, Deep Work, it is this concept where instead of focusing on maybe five things at the same time, maybe you focus on one thing for two to three hours and you completely finish that task before you move on to the next task. That can actually be really helpful for productivity because when we're in an environment like a home where there's so much sensory information going around and there's so much stimulation, we need to simplify our process of work instead of complicate our process of work. Um, so you need to have containment around activities. So containment around email. I don't check email all day long. I check email during a period of time. I have this one project that I work on for two to three hours and I stay focused in that time. I put on headphones. I close out the distractions around me. Maybe I turn my chair and I look in a corner because I'm limiting the amount of stimulation that's around me. So right now I'm in a room with whiteboards and a TV and chairs and I'm on this video and every time I see someone walk behind me, my mind is getting, it's using energy to shift focus. So really helpful on a neurological level is to limit the amount of stimulation that you're experiencing. Um, I listen to soundtracks or instrumental music when I work because soundtracks, they're gonna allow my brain to go into a more flow, fluid state. And there's no words, there's no podcast going on in the background because that's taking my attention away. Music allows me to connect with myself emotionally and connect with my work in meaningful ways. And what's interesting about soundtracks is it's gonna move between kind of high energy and low energy. And sometimes that can be really helpful in the work that I'm doing. Um, so those are some techniques and strategies when you are at home. Um, now the reality is uh, when we're at home, we also are dealing with the tension in our marriage or the tension with our partner or the tension with our kids much more than we would be if we just went away to an office. So once again, I, I wanna give you permission that this is very difficult um, with all the tension going on in the home and the stress and kids needing things and homeschooling kids. Find windows of deep work and commit to small um, incremental processes that are very focused and limit distractions in your work environment. Thank you. 
Um, I have a question about just in general, like this whole social distancing concept, right? And we're seeing all of these posts about, you know, call it physical distancing, social closeness. Um, we're not meant to be socially distant creatures, right? So what, what thoughts do you have around that? And what are some um, ways of, you know, coping with that, not experiencing, you know, the, the downside that, you know, we're not meant to, to be in these types of situations? We're really not meant to be that way. As a human species, the most distance that we typically need between us to feel safe is one to two feet. Now we're increasing that by sixfold or threefold. And um, our new bubble is much bigger, which means that it's difficult to feel, to feel a sense of uh, intimacy or relationship with other people around us. So it is very difficult. If I was completely honest, Abby is a licensed therapist and is someone who works with leadership and teams. I think this social distancing is traumatic socially. Um, we're not built for this. And this is going to have negative ramifications on us socially, even on us economically, on us in a mental health area. Now it's maybe what we have to do in a lot of ways but it's definitely not ideal. So the thing that I've been doing with my friends and with my community is I will make sure I still get out of my house. Oh, actually, Arizona's perfect right now. Our weather is amazing. We have amazing mountains. Um, I can go on a hike and not be so close to people, but still see people. And when I see people, I make a point to look at them in the eyes and I make a point to say hi. Because if, if we're just all head down, we're afraid to even get close to people, well, we can still make eye contact, we can still communicate, and we should do that as frequently as we can. The other thing is I have a consistent meeting. I have a meeting uh, typically every Tuesday night and every Friday morning with a group of friends, not, not business um, employees. I have it with friends and with my community. And I meet with them every single Tuesday and every single Friday over Zoom. And the reason why it's consistent is because in order for us to feel safe socially and relationally, we need consistency and we need availability. So if you are jumping into meetings of random places all over the place and then someone can't make it, I have a high level of commitment in the groups that I'm a part of that when people say they're going to show up, they show up and we show up at the same time. That provides us neurologically with a sense of comfort and safety and a sense of trust and stability in relationship. Um, so if you can, I would encourage you to find a way to get with a group of friends, even if it's one or two friends, same time every week and have a high level of accountability that we are getting together um, at the same time and we're committing to this. And if something in work comes up, sorry, we're shifting it. This is the priority. Um, so that's, that would be my suggestion of how I'm connecting right now. And I'm trying to connect more with my kids and my spouse, but it is, it is not normal and it is very, very difficult. Yeah. Um, so we have one question from an attendee. So there are obviously a lot of, um, just frustrations <laughs> flying around where, you know, it, money is stressful. Um, having enough money is stressful. Having to pay money right now is stressful. And if you're dealing with yeah. a vendor, a business partner, a, you know, you're trying to get someone to get on the same page as you and see your side, but you know, money is tight across the board and, and, um, it's cause for a lot of stressful situations. Do you have any tips for like, helping people figure out how to meet in the middle, helping people, um, you know, I, I know when I get frustrated, like you can feel it physically, right? How do you, how do you center yourself a little more? How do you maintain that calmness? How do you, you know, ultimately maintain your composure to get to the point where you're getting the other person to see your side of this and um, help resolve an issue rather than letting it blow up in, in your face? 
Yeah. So are you, Abby, are you talking about with employees or with customers? I, I think it could be any of the above. Um, and I don't know if the answer is the same or different depending on who the person is that you're, you're dealing with, but maybe if you could speak to both. Mm. Yeah. There's, uh, there's a technique that I really love, which is called uh, an empty chair technique. And I use this with myself, but you can also use this with other people who you're feeling frustrated with. Maybe it's a team member, um, maybe it's a spouse, or it's a customer. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna set up two chairs and they're gonna be, your two chairs are gonna be facing one another. So one chair is gonna be facing this way, the other chair is gonna be facing this way. And you, uh, in a private space, you get to rehearse this conversation and hash this out in private, so then you can apply it in public. So I would put my employee in that chair and I would talk to that chair as if they were there about my frustrations, about the things coming up for me. Maybe I can share more vulnerably with him about, or with her about what I'm struggling with or why this relationship is so difficult. And then I'll actually shift chairs and I'll sit in the employee's seat or I'll sit in my spouse's seat. And I will actually allow myself to speak as if I'm in that, that employee's, uh, employee's body. So I'll say, I hear what you're saying, but one thing that you're not taking into account is I'm doing X, Y, and Z. I feel like you really aren't appreciating the work that I do. And there are some factors in your leadership that are, I can tell the team is really struggling with. And then we switch back. And this is an opportunity to have this uh, rapid fire dialogue where you're trying to build empathy by getting in another person's skin and getting into their mind of what they might be thinking or feeling or processing. Now, in that dialogue, that back and forth chair work, you have to have a sense of compassion and you have to have a sense of curiosity. If you're going into that, just like if you go into any conversation with a sense of judgment or criticism or that you have all the answers, it's not gonna go well. So you need a sense of compassion that life is difficult right now, no one really knows what they're doing, and a sense of curiosity, like wondering and noticing and curious about what this person might be experiencing. When you do that back and forth, you're able to build a lot higher levels of empathy and you're actually able to resolve and work through conflict that way without even talking to that person. And I know that sounds really weird, but a lot of our issues with other people happen to be because they're issues inside of ourself. And when I do that back and forth dialogue, I'm actually working out my, my frustrations, uh, my judgments, my difficulties, my fears as a leader, my vulnerabilities. And as I can be honest with that, it, uh, it decreases the intensity that I feel in that relationship or maybe even with a client. And it is actually really helpful. Then when you go to have that conversation with the employee, you can be much more grounded and centered and empathic. Um, but I would suggest playing that out in a private room first, just switching chairs. It's gonna feel weird at first, but it's highly effective uh, on a biological, neurological level. Um, try it out, it, it will be helpful in the long run. Yeah, that's a really interesting tactic. And I love that it's so tangible too. Um, Okay, so this question maybe kind of builds off of that. And the question came in from an employee perspective, but maybe you can also answer it from an employer perspective. Uh, obviously, with everyone being remote right now, they're, uh, they're not used to being in, off being in an office with one another and being able to see that work is being done and you know we're all uh, grinding it out, right? So this question came in saying when i'm working alone i feel like i'm doing a good job but when i get in group meetings i feel like maybe people think i'm not doing enough or my leaders think that you know you're you might be slacking off um how how do you deal with that from i guess from both sides maybe this is a little bit more about like that that meeting in the middle but how do you have any tips both from the employee side as well as from the employer side to deal with this dynamic during this time of virtual work? Well, what I, 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 I can't speak specifically because I don't know people's unique businesses. I don't know your expectations mm -hmm. for your employees. I don't know how you communicate. I don't know the dynamics there, but let me say this, because this is what I do know. When we're under high levels of stress or toxic stress or trauma or tension, 
we don't go to our logical part of our brain. We go to our very emotional, um, subconscious part of our brain. And it usually deals with things with fight, flight, freeze, or submit. So if you have an employee that's showing up and they fight back every time you say something or they flee, they, you can't get a hold of them, or they freeze, they, they get in performance anxiety and they just freeze up, they can't get their work done. Or if you sense that they're always submitting and always saying yes, 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 um, burning themselves out but they don't have good boundaries, those are all signs that someone is actually not in their rational, creative brain, that they have a lot of high levels of stress going on. And it might be a conversation to just say, hey, um, I'm noticing these dynamics. You don't have to say fight, fight, or freeze, or submit. You can just pick up on those and say, can we just chat real briefly? Like, can you just tell me all the stressors that are going on in your life? Is there anything that I can do as your boss, as your um, leader, as your um, team member to help offload some of that? Mm -hmm. When we show that we care about someone's life beyond their performance, we build trust and we actually, we're actually calming their brain to allow them to access the rational driven prefrontal cortex part of their brain that is able to make good decisions, that is able to be creative. Um, but it comes through care and empathy and sincere uh, interest in another person's life. Um, so it could be something like, you know, I can tell this is a really stressful time. Like, are there external factors that are impacting your work here? And obviously there are. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But you're asking the question to show that you actually care and that they're um, that you actually care about what's going on in their life. Does, you don't have to solve anything about what's going on in their life. They could say, "I'm going through a divorce." They could say, "I'm I'm ha I'm blowing up at my kids." You don't have to solve any of that. And leaders need to know that because leaders get afraid that somehow when something gets put in front of their plate, they have to fix it. You don't have to do that. All you have to do is empathize and say, ah, man, I understand that that's probably so difficult for you right now to try to do that and do your projects here at, at, at the office. Is there some way that we can, we can support you or offload some of that? Because we do have these expectations of you to get this project done, but we also want to recognize that it's hard to get projects done when we have so much going on at home. Any way that we can support. Even having that dialogue can allow someone to know, okay, I don't have to hide what's going on at home. I don't have to be in my lower brain. I can actually feel safe in this relationship and they're gonna perform better typically for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really helpful I think for people to hear that you don't have to solve everyone's problems for them because I think that again, as, as managers, as business owners, I think you feel a large sense of, um, I don't know, a large sense of ownership for making sure that everyone's being taken care of, right? So as you're having those difficult conversations with employees, um, do you have any, how do you strike the right balance between um, empathizing too much versus too little or perceived per perceptionally, right? Too much or too little? Because I like what you said earlier about camp out there, but don't let it, like you can't let that consume your thoughts because you can't let everyone else's emotions, you know, overflow your own body. So how do you balance that while still, you know, showing that empathy? You have to really get to know yourself. So one size doesn't fit all. I typically will talk to leaders about, hey, let me know which spectrum that you're on. Which side do you lean to more? Do you lean more towards tough love, get it done, or there's gonna be a consequence, or do you lean more towards get it done when you can, empathy, connection. And if you're over here on giving people passes all the time, you can actually, most people are afraid that they're gonna to get too intense over here, but if you're all the way over here, you can apply quite a bit of pressure or quite a lot of movement, and you still won't end up over here. And I think for a lot of leaders who are very driven and motivated and they expect results of themselves and they expect results of others, they're way over here on this spectrum and they're afraid that what happens if I get too soft? Well, here's the reality. You will not jump all the way over here because that's not your natural disposition. So you're going to feel like you're over here, but you're probably more right here. 
And that's really important to know that when know which spectrum you're on and you can flex and move in a position without fear of arriving in that different quadrant. Now, if you're already in giving people so much grace and, and sitting down and having deep conversations with them and saying, oh, you can get this back to me later, then you actually need to move and transition and be more balanced and fluid. It's gonna be different based on the leader. It's gonna be different based on who you are. Um, and empathy is not a pass. Empathy is about connection. It's about hearing someone where they're at. And I love what you said, Abby, because we don't have to fix everything. And when we pretend like we can, uh, we're, um, we're a little narcissistic in some ways, and it shows that we're not being very vulnerable with our team. This is what I would encourage all leaders to start practicing. These simple words right here. I don't know. I don't know. And try this one on for size two. I'm actually really struggling today. I don't really need to talk about it or go into it. I just want you to know that today's a tough day. Mm -hmm. To say, I don't know, and to say today's a tough day gives people that you oversee permission to go, oh, wow. Maybe I don't have to expect this person to be a machine, to be perfect all the time, to be optimistic every moment of the day. And then your employees are going to stop putting that pressure on you because you're not modeling to them that you are put together all the time, that you are perfect. If you put it out there that you have all the answers, that you, you do have it together, guess what? Your employees are going to expect you to be there. But when you start to letting them know I'm struggling today or I don't know, you know, this person might know that better or let me give me an extra day to think about that so I can really chew on that. That gives people, your employees, the reality to say, oh, okay, well, I'm not going to put as much pressure on him because uh, he's human or she's human. So those are some, those are some things that you can do. Thank you. Um, my last question. So do you have any um, advice, recommendations, uh, resources where, you know, let's say that we, you know, maybe it's an employee, maybe it's ourselves, maybe it's a family member, and we just identify that they're really struggling and continuing to really struggle. And you get to the point where, you know, you're worried about them, where as, as business leaders and as just human beings, where should we, what should we know about how to um, direct toward resources in those situations or maybe like intervene if we need to? Right. Once again, these questions are so uh, unique to the environment. Yeah. So I'm not going to give justice to this exactly, but if you sense that someone is off, just sit down with them and say, hey, I'm not going to penalize you for having a bad day or having something stressful going on right now. Um, I just, I notice this about you over, notice this curiosity that I'm having right now. I say, I notice, you know, it's, I just don't see you smile a lot here. And you don't have to smile a lot, but I'm really curious, like, what's going on inside? Asking questions like that, but not feeling like you have to follow up and solve that. Um, asking a question like, hey, how can I best support you? Or saying, I do have these resources. Go talk with HR. We have a program for you. It could be a course online that you know of. Um, it could be a training that you bring someone in to do a training with your team. The thing that I find for leaders is um, it's really helpful for them when they can tap me or tap other people to come in and speak with their team because they don't have to be the expert on those issues. They can let someone else take over, but they will know that they're taking care of their team. They're involved in the facilitation of getting that person care, but they're not the person getting care. So it could be having someone come in and do a training. It could be a webinar that you saw or really liked, a podcast. It could be mental health services. It could be providing a 30% funding for mental health counseling services during the season. Um, it could be setting up a mentally healthy workforce policies and procedures with your HR department, different people. Um, but, but as far as employees goes, I just want to really uh, address Abby too. We got to help our leaders. Like if we're not helping the CEOs and the founders, it doesn't matter how well the employees are doing. The company and the, the culture is going to collapse. And we think, um, 
we think that employees, we think that leaders and founders and CEOs, they're good. And we want to equip them to show up for their employees, but we got to have people show up for our CEOs and our founders. We have to have layers above them whose main interest is to make sure that they don't lose the most important things in their life in their process of building a company. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't have people above them, I'm not talking about an executive board. I'm talking about people who are solely interested in their well-being, giving them spaces to process then we're really doing a disservice to the business industry. And ultimately we're doing a disservice to employees because the healthiest companies have the healthiest leaders. And if leaders face their stuff and get the support that they need, they will trickle that down to their employees. So I say, start with the leader, support them. And that will naturally flow out into that leader wanting to support their employees. It's a really good reminder. Great. Well, we have just a minute or two left here. Um, Andy, is there any, any last words that you want to just wrap things up with before I dive into announcements? You know, I think I'd want to just give people the permission to feel right now and to not have to perform like they were performing three months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a great article that came out about millennials specifically, and that's the category that I'm in, as being the burnout generation. Because they have this feeling now that they're at home, they're expected to cook more, to play with their kids more, to be more productive. And all that pressure in the midst of a moment and a time of high levels of trauma and high levels of grief is not only unrealistic, it's unfair and uh, get work done, but recognize that there are different seasons of work and you might be needing to uh, slow down right now so that when that season of performance and productivity opens back up again, you're, you have the energy to kick into gear. Don't burn yourself out right now with the expectations that you have on yourself in a moment of grief so that you can't show up later. Preserve your energy, get your work done, but give yourself a lot of permission, a lot of grace in this season, and just know that I'm in it with you. Thank you so much, Andy. These were great tips, great reminders. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time today. Oh, thanks, Abby. Real quick, just a couple final reminders. So our final webinar is on Thursday. Thank you for joining us. Those of you who have been sitting in on these throughout, um, again, uh, we're going to be having Insperity present. So Jill Chapman from Insperity is going to be discussing pandemics box once the workforce is remote. How do you get people to re-engage? How do you get people to come back once uh, you know we're, we're able to do so again? I know this topic did change. Um, they had to do a change in speakers and thus a change in topics. Um, so I know we were going to do a second session on the CARES Act. If you have specific questions on the CARES Act, since we won't be able to cover this again on Thursday, please feel free to reach out directly to us. Our team has been pulling together a ton of resources around that. Other reminders, if you didn't sign up for one of those one-on-one -on -one sessions with our team, please do so. This week is the last week where we have um, set sessions. And then if you don't sign up for one next week, we're going to be dialing everyone just to check in with you post-program. So please sign up. And again, thank you for joining us. We have recorded this webinar, so thank you, Andy, for letting us do that. We're gonna be posting it to that Vimeo page and we'll also follow up in an email as usual and send it to you that way. So thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you have a great rest of your day. I hope you're able to take some of these tips from Andy and implement them in your day to day. Um, and feel free to reach out if you need anything. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good one.